Please be seated. As Mickey said, uh, sweet hour uh, to gather together, uh, an hour of prayer and worship. And uh, I don't know about you, there's a, there's a lot of things on my heart this morning. Uh, I'm sure there is yours, and yet God knows it all. Amen? Every thought, every concern, every worry, every care, every burden. Uh, let's go. Let's go to him. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, we come into your house this morning uh, again as, uh, as your people because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, because you opened the eyes of our hearts months ago, years ago, uh, to believe on the gospel of grace, the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And, and we're here today as your people because we believe with all of our hearts in Holy Scripture. Uh, your word is perfect, as David says in the Psalms, as the psalmists say. Uh, it's complete, it's perfect, it's lacking nothing. Uh, as the Lord Jesus lacks nothing, uh, your word lacks nothing to our hearts. And uh, it's uh, everything, it's life, it's... Um, spiritual sap to our bones, um, it's encouragement, it's hope, uh, it's peace, it's blessing, it's joy, it's strength, uh, it's everything, uh, it's the abundant life, uh, Christ is the abundant life and your word uh, is alive and it's active uh, and it's everything to us and we, we come and yet we've failed uh, miserably in so many, many ways, and yet we come this morning as your people, a needy people, and yet the people of God, a people of uh, your uh, own possession, uh, holy, chosen, and royal. Uh, as the parable of the prodigal teaches us, uh, you fatten, you fatten the calf, you bring out um, the robe, the ring, um, you clean us up. Uh, constantly. And uh, we bless you so much for that. We bless you for the precious blood of Christ that's able to make the foulest clean and allow the foulest uh, to come before your throne of grace, uh, as I do, Lord, this morning and as your people do. And we pray that you uh, would comfort our hearts, that you would give us great joy and peace, uh, resolve, uh, to lay aside the cares of the world, uh, the things of the world, uh, the things that trip us up, the things that easily entangle us, uh, the things that uh, discourage us, uh, the things that keeping, uh, keep us from uh, everything that you want us to be. Uh, we, uh, we thank you that you know every, every thought, every care, every concern, every burden, every situation, uh, whatever's on our heart from moment to moment, you know it all. And we pray that we would find great grace uh, to be able to rest in that. Uh, thank you for your great, great love. Uh, thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Father, I want to lift up those in our congregation who aren't physically here today because they're unable to, um, through a great physical trial, and suffering and difficulty, and we pray that you would bless their hearts. Uh, you know who they are, uh, and at times when I in, um, mention people, I often forget, so we lift them up. We pray that you would uh, give them physical comfort if it be your will. Uh, we pray that as they suffer, that they would enter into the sufferings of Christ and, and find themselves closer to you and find strength and uh, your presence to be a, a great comfort to them. Also, Father, too, um, we lift up our community here in Rainham, uh, the many people who uh, give no thought to you right now, who do not darken the door of a church, who do not understand the gospel. Um, we lift them up before you, Lord. And we pray that you would open their eyes, 
uh, open their hearts uh, as they drive by and look at uh, the message on the sign. May they understand that you're bread and sustenance and life to them. And we pray that you would um, stir their hearts to pull in and to uh, contemplate and uh, to seek your face. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move to that end for every car, every family, every household represented uh, that would drive by this church sign, this church, that uh, the Holy Spirit of God would quicken their hearts uh, to give thought to him. And Father, also I pray for our nation, uh, those that lead us. Um, Lord, uh, we need your help. Um, uh, we have many many people who are godless, who affirm uh, wicked things, who uh, embrace uh, godlessness and wickedness and unrighteousness and actually castigate righteousness and godliness and, and goodness. And um, I think of what Isaiah wrote, uh, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Uh, and, Lord, that's the times in which we're living, so we need your help for our country as well. Uh, may you descend. And may um, you turn hearts um, towards you. Uh, turn our hearts towards you during this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have our first reading of Scripture this morning. First reading of scripture. I'm going to need the church's assistance this morning. I gave Bill Genesis, and I thought I was going to read Genesis, so I will read from Deuteronomy. And I have no idea what page that is on in the New Church Bible. But I do know, according to the bulletin, it's the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 26 through 29. And again, it was the computer's fault, not mine. <laughs> right. So now you have to come back next week to see if I get it right. Again, the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 26 through 29. There is none like the God of Jerusalem, who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he drove out the enemy from before you and said, destroy. So Israel dwells in security. The fountain of Jacob secluded in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens also drop down dew. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies will cringe before you and you will tread upon their high places. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from the 35th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 to 8, and that is on page 32 of the Church Bible. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which were among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments, and let us arise and go to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, 
and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. As they journeyed there, was a, as they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebecca's, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the oak. It was named Alon Bakuth. This is the word of our Lord. Uh, we dare not do this time unless we commit it to prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, open the eyes of our hearts with this scripture, and as your Holy Spirit, only your Holy Spirit is able to do, speak to our hearts and uh, give us insight and wisdom and understanding, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, folks, uh, on Thursday... uh, Wednesday to Thursday, I was pretty certain that God would have me speak to uh, this passage in Genesis 35. And yesterday, uh, somebody gave me a devotional to read, and it made reference to returning to Bethel. And um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to read this devotional before we look at the text. Uh, This is taken from the Minuteman devotional. It's called Abandoning Retail. And it's by Jason Cruz. Quote, If you asked me a year ago what I believed are the greatest challenges facing churches today, I'd have offered up an answer having to do with how we fail to do church in a way that makes sense to our modern culture. I would have stated that while our message must never change our approaches to ministry, must always be changing. Today, however, if you were to ask me the same question, I'd bring you a simpler answer. I am now convinced that what is missing in churches today is not simply a better way to do ministry. What's missing in our churches is favor, God's favor. The New Testament church we read about in the book of Acts had no money, No technology, no marketing plan, no children's ministries, and no ministers with postgraduate degrees. All of those things can be wonderful assets in ministry today, but the New Testament church had none of them. And yet that small band of Holy Spirit-fueled believers radically changed the world and the culture around them. Churches in America today have everything they need and then some, but we pose little threat to our culture. I believe that's because we're missing the favor God gave his people in New Testament times. We can't buy favor with money. Favor comes from God. And he gives it to churches who want it more than they want a campus other churches would envy. Favor comes when people who fill the pews are more interested in God's presence than simply presenting a retail form of Christianity that gives folks the ability to shop for churches like they're shopping at Target. Favor is the Bethel to which we must return. Without it, we can do everything we want to grow churches, but we'll never grow a kingdom. I thought that that was a very, very timely devotional uh, as I was led, um, coincidentally, several days uh, before to uh, speak on. Let's, let's put the returning to Bethel 
and God's dealings with Jacob in proper context. Bethel has its place. It's mentioned in Genesis 28. Uh, This is where Jacob, after stealing the blessing, the spiritual birthright, uh, you know, the thing that gets you to heaven, after stealing that, he flees from Esau, goes about 12 to 13 miles a day's journey, and he finally beds down for the night, and he takes a stone, and he uses it as, uses it as his pillow. <laughs> you know, the, the my pillow man ought to take that and say, mine's better than that. But Jacob has this pillow of stone, and yet God meets him in a dream at night, and he has this vision or this dream of angels ascending and descending. And of course, you probably know that that is known, that passage is known as Jacob's ladder. And he wakes up and he goes, surely God is in this place. So he takes out his little anointing oil and he takes the stone and he erects it as a pillar and he pours oil on it. And at that time, he decided to make a five-part vow. You can look at this later. It's from Genesis 28, verses 10 through 20, verse 22. Five-part vow, all conditional. Uh, God, if you go with me, like your presence, if you protect me, if you provide for me food, clothing, shelter, if you give me safety to return to my homeland sometime years from now, I'm going to give, give you ten, a tenth, a tithe of everything I give, I, I possess. Five, five part veil. Now, that's important to understand chapter 35, verses 1 through 8, because God tells Jacob to return to Bethel. So clearly, Bethel has a very, very special place in the life of Jacob. And think about it. This is the, 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 the first place of God's dealings with Jacob to reveal himself to him. And when I, getting his attention and speaking to his heart, they're, they're first steps. But here's the other thing that we, we, we can't overlook when we look at Genesis 35, verses 1 through 8. From chapter 28 to chapter 35, there's a whole lot that happens in the life of Jacob. And some 20-some 20, 20 years have gone by. You know, Jacob went up to the north country, Padan Aram, and he hangs out like near Haran, where Abraham first settled with his father and brothers. And he goes back to settle uh, for a time with Laban, Rebekah's mother, or Rebekah's brother. And during those 20 years, and you know Jacob was a deceitful kind of guy. And and his name means heel, supplanter. He was all about deceit. You know, you didn't want to do business with Jacob. Well, Jacob finally meets his match in Laban. And he was severely schooled in the school of deceit. And, and, And he was severely taken advantage of. Now you talk about spiritual karma. God was getting Jacob's attention. And so, four wives later, 20-some years, over 20 years later, 12 children later, God appears to him in Genesis 31, and he says, get up and go back to Bethel. In verse 3 of chapter 31, he says that. Go back to your homeland. And then in verse 13, He says, I'm the God of Bethel, go back to your homeland. Now, so Jacob takes off at night, you know, doesn't tell Laban what he's doing, and that was kind of a big issue that was finally settled. But in chapter 32, Jacob's all sorts of in an angst about Esau. You know, I I I stole the birthright. I you know, I'm going back to the homeland. And so the the flesh comes up here. The picture is, you know, he, he's struggling to trust God now because he's afraid of Esau. Remember the prayer was for safety? But here's, here's the problem. I don't know that Jacob necessarily really knows the Lord, truly, at this point. And so in Genesis 34, 
It's kind of like, you know, when you're younger, you hear the gospel and you hear about Christ and you hear about salvation and you hear about deliverance and you hear about all the good things that God offers. And yet, you know, you don't quite really jump all in. You know, it's kind of like going to the swimming pool or the, or the beach. You know, you put your foot in a little bit, see how cold you test the water. Uh, Jacob is not a saved man in Genesis 28. He becomes a saved man in Genesis 32. And he wrestles with God all night. And you probably know the story. You know, he wouldn't let him go until God blessed him. But God t touched him. <laughs> not the kind of touch you really want from God. But it put his hip socket out. And, 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 and Danny and I were talking about this Wednesday night. Jacob was probably one of these guys like this for the rest of his life. One of those things of the flesh where God, you know, every single morning, when he, when he, every single eve, throughout the day, it was always there to remind him of that moment. And that was a precious moment. He wrestled with God and he changed his name. That's, that's a beautiful, beautiful picture of salvation. Genesis 33 and 34, they kind of move. Uh, he, he actually, Genesis 33, he meets Esau. Everything's honky-dory. They kind of make, you know, amends and, you know, Jacob's safe and he departs. Makes one huge mistake, though. He settles in Shechem. Shechem's not the homeland. <laughs> it's part of the promised land, but it's not the homeland. And, and so uh, this creates huge trouble for Jacob. Huge trouble. Uh, the Canaanites, the Shechemites, were embedded in Shechem. It was a royal city. It was a place uh, of worship. It was, it, it was their land. And he buys some land and he settles in. And it cost him a lot. Cost them a lot. You know, it's kind of like the picture of worldliness, you know, kind of like intertwined with the world. His daughter Dinah was violated, and that led to more trouble. Uh, Levi and Simeon, they turn around under the, and they learn from their father real well. They were very deceitful. They used religion as a guise. Hey, all you guys got to get circumcised if you want my sister. And then they killed them when they were in that compromised situation. And so, if you read the account at the end of 34, Jacob's terrified. These people are going to come up against me, the flesh again. They're going to come up against me. They're going to kill me. Uh, I don't know what to do. And God visits him again. Every time Jacob is in trouble and he's troubled, God visits. Isn't that wonderful? And so this is how we need to start to understand Genesis 35. It's a spiritual journey and a pilgrimage back to the time where God started to pull on the strings of his heart. It's a return to God. It's a return to fulfill a vow. Remember the five-part vow? Take a look at Genesis 35.1. It was God that told Jacob repeatedly, to go up to Bethel. It wasn't Jacob's decision. It was God who repeatedly told him that. You know, uh, it's one thing for us to have an idea. It's another thing for God to have an idea. My ways are not your ways, right? That's what he says. And, and you know, as I read this account, it, it's almost as if Jacob forgot the vow that he made 20 years earlier. He's hanging out with Laban. He's hanging out in Shechem. And the vow's almost like not even in the back of his mind. And, it, and, it's, and it's huge. It's, this is God's idea. And, and here's the other thing I, I was looking at. Consider the parallels between the first Bethel and the return to Bethel. He's fleeing on both occasions. He's fleeing from the Shechemites. Years earlier, it was Esau. Deception plagued each situation. Fear dominated each event. And yet God always meets him when he's most troubled. Wow. 
You know, his, his name was compromised on both occasions, too. Esau hated him. Laban wound up hating him. The Shechemites hated him. Everybody hated Jacob. They still hate the seed of Jacob today, to this day. The, the other thing I want you to understand here uh, with Jacob's return to Bethel, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, this wasn't Jacob's idea. This was God's idea. This is an imperative. This is a command. Uh, notice the words. God says, arise, go up, settle, and make. And in the Hebrew, they're all in the imperative mood, which basically means that it's not optional. It's a command. It's not, will you get me you know, a glass of water? It's, get me a glass of water. That's what it is. It's a command. And, and, and so this is not an optional thing. It's divinely ordered, the return to Bethel. And what you also want to see here, too, there's, there's a moral obligation to fulfill the vow. You know, uh, it says in Ecclesiastes, do not vow unless you're able to pay the vow. You don't vow before God or anyone else unless you're able to pay, because it's an affront to your character. So there's, an immor there's a moral obligation here. And, and he, no, notice, he is to build an altar. It, it's not about the stone anymore. You know, we have the anointed stone 20 years earlier. Now he's to build an altar. It's more than just an anointed stone. But it's more than just an altar. Because the altar is the outward sign of what God expects inwardly from the heart. It points to Jacob's inward condition. He's ready. He's ready to build the altar because his heart's ready. Yeah, and, you know, and, and, you, and you contrast, years earlier he was bartering. Well, God, if you do this and you do this and you do and I, maybe I'll, I'll do that. All right? And, and what it teaches us is that he wasn't settled in the things of God years earlier. And now the time has come for him to complete the vow. The other thing I want you to notice here, and we're going to try to make application to all this. The, the, the other thing I want you to notice, whatever God told Jacob, I mean, he, he turns around and it's like, it's just not for him. He tells his whole household. He tells the people. When was the last time you challenged your household to the things of God? When was the last time you told them about Jesus Christ in the gospel? When was the last time you shared with your aunt, your uncle, your nieces, your nephews? Here's the other thing that we want to understand. Uh, Jacob is in Shechem. Shechem is a town. <laughs> the landscape is such that it's kind of like a, camel, a camelback, but it's at a, a crossroads. Geologically, it's at a crossroads in such a way where you have to make a decision, you know, along the road in which way to go. And, and so it becomes a huge place of decision in Israel's history. And, and, and this is a huge spiritual decision as well. And, and so take a look at what they're told to do. Put away the foreign gods in the earrings, purify themselves, and change their garments. And what I want you to see here, this, this whole picture is one of spiritual preparation and renewal. It, to return to Bethel. To return back to God. And, and it's a time of spiritual cleansing. A time of intentional change. And, and, it's, and it's getting serious. That's what it is. Notice the digging down. The burying of idols. Digging deeper, <laughs> taking all the stuff and getting rid of it, and burying it and leaving it. Uh, it it's a picture of taking it to the next level, is it not? Uh, again, from an anointed stone, a stony heart, to an altar that's in the heart. That's the picture here. Uh, you know, last week we looked at uh, 1 Samuel 7. 
uh, the, the account of Ebenezer, you know, God's help. And the passage uh, last week had national and personal implications of repentance and renewal. This passage here is very, very similar in those parallels. This is Jacob's Ebenezer. That's what this is. You know, the stone of God's help. This, this is his Ebenezer. This is his Bethel. And, 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 and I want you to notice that it's not only for him, but it's for his whole household. And by the way, his whole household involves now all the Shechemites that they took as spoils of war. That's what it is. Now his, this is not only for Jacob and his household, it's for the nation. Because he's named Israel now. It's for the nation. A couple of other things here that I, that I wanna, uh, uh, want you to see or kind of point out before I um, go further with application. Did you notice that it was not only like the little like idols and foreign gods that they buried, but it was the earrings. And uh, no, you don't have to bury your earrings, okay? <laughs> guys, you should bury your earrings. Women, do not have to bury your earrings. I don't, I don't like earrings with guys. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but just whatever. Okay. I think it's more than a cultural thing. Anyway, scholars point out that the spoils of war were taken when they killed all the Shechemites. That's what you do. <laughs> you take all their stuff. And they took their foreign gods and their earrings and whatever, and their wives. They, 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 they took the wives and the children. Took everything. And so the earrings are to be buried as well because they're things that can be melted down. Remember uh, all the Israelites when they wanted to build the sanctuary? Uh, a tabernacle to God, they took all their, they took everything, all the gold and silver, and they melted it all down. Now, they also made the calf, too, the, the golden calf. And, and the other thing here that I want you to notice is this. Uh, scripture says that they gave all. You know, unlike Achan, remember Achan took some spoils of war and he kept it for himself and it brought great tragedy upon the Israelites in battle at the Battle of Ai? But the scripture says here that they, they didn't hold anything back. They gave every earring and every idol. None were kept. And, and notice what Jacob does. He buries it below the oak tree in Shechem. Now, this is, this is huge. Shechem is a place of idolatry. The tree... The presence was always symbolic of the divine presence of God, a sacred place. Instead of smashing them, he buries them <laughs> because no one's going to dig up the hallowed ground. Jacob didn't care about these things. They weren't sacred to him anymore, and he buries them. And, and here's, here's the other thing I want you to, because I think there's something very precious here. Notice, too, that the account actually and strangely ends with Deborah, Rebecca's lifelong nurse, nanny, so to speak, to their, her kids, Esau and Jacob. She's buried uh, beneath or below an oak tree, but it's not in Shechem. It's in Bethel. I think there's huge spiritual implications there, folks. All the idols at the oak tree in Shechem, Deborah, precious in the sight of God, buried at the house of Bethel under the oak tree. And I think that they have huge, deep, deeper spiritual truths. Okay, so the question is this. What, what does all this mean to you and me today? I think that's the question, right? <clears throat> One more thing before I get there. <clears throat> Bethel, house of God, now the return after he sacrifices, it's El Bethel. It's the God of Bethel. And what I want you to see here is this. It's almost like 20-some years earlier that God was just limited to one location and to Jacob's heart and his life as a little special kind of memorial. And years later, 
it's so expanded. It's the whole town. It's his household. It's the community. It's the nation. That's the picture here. It's all-encompassing, far-reaching. And, and so here's the takeaway. You and I are Jacob's, and we need to return to Bethel. We need to return to the place of Jacob's ladder. The first, the first inklings of when we had a sense of, there's a tremendous God and tremendous gospel and a tremendous salvation, so great a salvation. Do you know that the Lord Jesus himself said to Nathaniel, <laughs> I'm Jacob's ladder. That's the interpretation at the end of chapter 1 in, in John's gospel. You're going to see, he, said, he, said, he said to Nathaniel, <laughs> you just wait. You're going to see angels ascending and descending upon me because I'm Jacob's ladder. And, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And, and, and so I think the implication here, as the church, the people of God, we, we all need a spiritual renewal. We need to make spiritual preparations, if you will, to put away, purify, change the garments. Now, obviously, in the Old Testament, that was, you know, spiritual, I mean, uh, 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 literally purification. Today, Christ is our purification. But there has to be a decision made, is, does, does there not? Uh, we all need to arise and to go up and to settle in Bethel, not in Shechem. And we need to build, you know, the altar, so to speak. Now, when I say we need to build, God has built everything for us. But we need to have that Shechem moment where we bury everything. And because Shechem is Jacob's place of decision, and every, every believer has to have a Shechem at some point where you bury all the idols. I, I mean all of it. Not some of it, just all of it. It's a time to dig deeper. Uh, this can be a Shechem. You know, in your prayer closet, that can be a Shechem. You can have a Shechem moment on vacation. I suppose you could have a Shechem moment at work during lunchtime. Although that's not where I would choose my Shechem, right? But a Shechem could be any place. And so we have all the outward preparations here, but they're, they're representative of what takes place inwardly. It's, a, it's the same way here. We have all the outward preparations, but it's what takes place here. Because the physical speaks to the spiritual. And, and, and I, I don't know about you, but we always have issues and matters of the heart, do we not? I mean, you know, some of you are great, great gardeners. You have the green thumb. Uh, it's a gift. But don't you have to constantly weed? You've got to weed the garden. Danny's a farmer. He's sitting there. He knows what weeds are. <laughs> Kathy, I think you do too. And, 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 and so... This is important. God doesn't tell us to arise and go up to a Bethel and to build an altar and all that. Because he is the altar. But he does tell us to abide and to worship and to rest in what he's done. And he does challenge us to put away the idols. And, you know, oh my goodness, I mean, we all have idols. We all have different idols. We all have cherished idols. And, and so, a return to Bethel here is a return to the Lord. That's how we want to see it. It's targeting those, those areas of our life, our heart, our soul, our spirit, to say, you know, God, I, I got to give this over. I know I gave it over to you before, but I want to give it over again. That's what it is. It's a, it's a burying of the idols. Now, Depending on your situation, maybe you accepted the Lord Jesus 50 years ago, you know, 55 months ago, whatever, okay? But remember when we accepted Christ, when you accepted Christ, when I, just go back to the time that you accepted the Lord. Remember that, remember that time where you had that moment? You came away, you knew your sins were forgiven, 
You knew you were cleansed. You knew you were heaven bound. And you were so excited. Man, you were excited. I'm telling you, right? I told everybody. I, you know, I can't keep my mouth shut anyway, right? I told everybody. Everybody. I mean, I could, I could shake a stick at everybody. And I talked about the Lord 24-7. There were Christians that were 50, 60, 70 years in the Lord and said, He always talks about the Lord. Always. And you know something? I need a return to Bethel because I don't always do that anymore. Do you remember the time where you were so excited and you ran around and you told people? Remember when he was your first love? Your heart panted. You were like just overwhelmed at the things of God and what he did to you. Remember that? Remember when you were on fire? I mean, you were just, you know, if it was, if it was a literal fire, you burned down thousands of acres. Remember that? It should bring tears to our eyes that we're not like that anymore. This is what I need. This is what our churches need. This is what all the people of God need. A, a spiritual pilgrimage. You don't have to go to the Holy Land. That's the beautiful thing. You don't have to go on a trip for two, three weeks, worry about bullets or missiles flying. You can just do it right in, a, in, in your own bedroom, right? A, a spiritual pilgrimage, a return to the Lord. And, and wasn't that devotional spot on this morning? What a great devotional. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic. And, and you know, a spiritual revival will never happen until we have a spiritual pilgrimage back to God. And when that happens, then God's favor will be evident. Then the people will tremble and fear. I was reading a devotional months ago. I can't remember. I may have shared it with you. One, 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 uh, it was in, out of the book, uh, 100 um, Bible Verses That Made America. George Whitfield, tremendous evangelist in the 17th century, People just dropped everything. I mean, they said, they said that you could see dust, dust smoke and, you know, almost like, a, almost like a nuclear dust bomb went off for miles and miles. People just dropped everything. They jumped on their horses, and, the, and when the horses were exhausted, they walked just to hear the gospel of God from Whitfield. Tremendous, tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Tremendous. Oh, my goodness. One final thought before we um, go to communion. I, I talked about the burying of the idols and the burying of Re, uh, Re, uh, Rebecca's nurse, Deborah, right? I think there's something there. When you come to the New Testament, uh, our sins are buried in Christ, are they not? Romans 6. They're buried in Christ. They're buried at the foot of the cross. The tree. <laughs> They're buried at the tree. They're buried in Christ. And when yet we come over to um, the Bethel, if you will, our lives are buried, are hidden in Christ too. And I think, that, I think that the idols are representative of sin, and I think that Deborah is representative of our life hitting God in Christ. It's a burial. It's what it is. Um, you know, you, you bury all the bad stuff at the Shechem, and you bury all the good stuff in the house of God. That's what it is. Uh, I, I'm totally convinced that, uh, that, that Deborah was, is totally representative here and a picture of the saint that's hidden the life of Christ. The old has passed away. It's a, it's a prepared place, a burial ground for the believer to rest in, to abide in, to worship in.
And, and so this, this whole passage here, this whole passage is a return to God, a return to Jacob's ladder, the Lord Jesus Christ. The former things are buried. Our very lives are buried in him. And now that it's the moral obligation to fulfill the vow that we made years ago to accept him as Savior and Lord. Uh, Jacob was visited and reminded about that vow. And he was challenged by God to undertake that vow. And I think that that's what comes out of the pages here. as a challenge for the Christian. Because of everything buried and life hid in Christ to fulfill that vow and to just let everything else go. Uh, so the decision to make him our Savior and Lord needs to be renewed. And it's from Shechem to Bethel. Uh, I believe that every believer needs to make this trip at some point. I don't believe it's optional at some point. Some may make it more than others. That's okay. But that's, that's what God has laid upon my heart. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for these scriptures. And thank you for the brilliance and the wisdom and the truth and uh, the nuggets that come out of the text. Thank you for blessing my heart with that. And um, I pray that you uh, have blessed the hearts of your people with that. Uh, more so, Lord, uh, may uh, you bless us uh, with uh, receiving the challenge to uh, bury the former things and uh, to go deeper and to be more serious and uh, to be that saint uh, that has gone back to its first love, to their first love, uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, as we enter into this time of communion, uh, we pray that we would sense your presence, uh, and we would have the joy of the Lord, uh, your strength, and great peace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.